Jeff, what were some of the best performing sectors and stocks in your portfolio in 2009? Uh, we did really, really well with Smart Grid. Um, Enernot, Converge, um, those were two real big winners for us. Uh, I think 2009 was a good year for Smart Grid overall because it finally got a lot of uh, investor attention that mm -hmm. it wasn't getting in 2008. Um, and Again, I mean, look at policy support. Um, the government has been very, very supportive of energy efficiency and conservation method, uh, measures because it, as they always say, it's the low-hanging fruit, you know, and it really is. Um, and again, as, and you're also looking at a lot of this technology that um, it, they're not really inventing, reinventing the wheel. You know, it's, it's, it's not uh, rocket science. They just, it's a matter of integrating this stuff. And companies like Converge and Internet got a lot of big uh, contracts last year and a lot of the utilities are signing on. So I think 2010 is going to be a really good year for Smart Grid as well. So you mentioned a few stocks. What were some of your favorite stocks last year and their performance? Uh, some of my favorite stocks last year, a lot of the Chinese solar stocks just uh, just killed it. Um, and again, I mean, it's it, I, I suspect we're going to we're going to see the same thing in 2010, maybe not to the same degree. Um, but yeah, the so still outperforming the market, but maybe not to the extent that they did in 2009. Right. I think. Well, I think what happened in 2009 was with all the policy support in China, um, a lot of the um, the big money kind of finally signed on to China because a couple of years ago, China, you know, for obvious reasons, their um, people are very skeptical of China. You know, say, oh, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Well, okay, you've said a lot of things before. Um, so I think there were a lot of investors that were very skeptical. I certainly was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, a few years ago, we wouldn't touch the Chinese solar stocks. Um, but it just, it kind of got to that point. It just, it was make or break, and, and you knew like the policy, policy support was, coming was there, through, supporting it. And these companies were, they were, they were selling more solar panels and more solar cells um, than the than the European companies and the U.S. companies. And at the end of the day, it's like, I, if I look at the sales, I, I know what's happening. If I look at how much, um, you know, their future contracts, it's, you know, you just. You have to make a move. You know at what some the pipeline point. is. Yeah. So and that's what we did. And one thing we really focused on in China were the um, companies that do have really close connections with the government. Because obviously in China, if you're if you're tied in with the government, you're set. Um, so companies like Yingli was really good. Solar Fun was another one. SunTech Power, um, JA Solar, which actually makes solar cells. Um, they make them cheaper than anybody and faster than anybody. And and that's that's one of those companies that I think is a was a sleeper for a while. It really came to life towards the end of 2009. Um, uh, but I, I don't see any competition for that company in 2010. So 2010 and the next decade, what are some of the sectors that you're more bullish on? Um, we're still and maybe some of the companies that would ben benefit. I would say we're pretty. We haven't really changed much. The only I, I would say that um, you know the, the the Chinese solar companies are, are we're still real strong on the um, also companies manufacturing solar manufacturers that are coming to the U.S. to set up shop in the U.S. because they're going to get stimulus dollars and that's going to push stock up. Um, even if it's only for a short amount of time, so we'll, you know, we'll probably trade some of those stocks too, and we know like who's, you know, what company is going where when they make their decisions, um, because we know that once the contracts are signed, they start making, start building those facilities, um, the money's going to start showing up. Um, as far as wind, um, we're still real bullish on wind. The turbine manufacturers uh, are, are really the the main way to go. Um, I'm actually pretty big on developers at this point, the companies that are actually developing the wind farms. You don't have a lot of pure, play that, pure plays there. You have a lot of um, funds that might have three, um, three holdings of, of, of smaller companies. Um, there is one, Western Wind Power Corporation is a company that I'm, I'm really bullish on. Um, they're a pure wind developer. They're set up in California, and as you should probably know, uh, as of the start of the year, California is a 20% renewable portfolio standard. None of the utilities are, have, have made it so right. far, so they need every they need every watt they can get. Um, so, essentially, any any renewable power in California, I mean, it's got a home and it's got a contract. Um, so I like Western Wind because they have a small facility now, but they have a 120 megawatt farm that they're building this year. Um, they have all the funding they need. The power per, the power purchase agreement is done. I mean. Everything's done. It's just a matter of building at this point. Right. Um, and you know, there's still there's still some problems with some of these companies getting funding. So anytime I see a company that they have funding in place, I, I'm very attentive. So you talked about some of the direct ways that investors can go. Is are there indirect plays like uh, say a Goldman Sachs or Honda or Continental? Some of the companies sure. that seemingly are greener than others. Um, well, there's a couple ways to look at. It. I mean, there's some people that want to invest in companies that kind of have a green arm. Mode. Yeah, it's just kind of like well. Okay, they may have some holdings in Monsanto, which obviously is not a green company, um, but they're very bullish on a lot of solar wind companies. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that, that's a slippery slope because that really that's really a philosophical investing technique. Um, and I mean, I'll be honest with you, everyone has their own idea of what green is, but you know, you invest to make money. 
So, um, you know, I, I've never really understood the idea of investing in something if at the end of the day there wasn't going to be some kind of payoff. Um, so, but then you, there are other indirect plays. One I can think of off the top of my head is uh, American Superconductor, mm -hmm. um, is a company that provides uh, certain mechanisms for uh, wind turbines that are built by a company called Sinovel, which is a Chinese turbine manufacturer. Well, I mean, that company has been getting millions and millions of dollars of contracts in 2009 from Sinovel. Sinovel is going to be the biggest wind turbine manufacturer in the world in a couple of years. I mean, they're the biggest in China. Um, and, you know, everything in China, the way it's been going, I mean, they're, they're just, again, it, it always comes back to the same thing. They do it cheaper, they do it faster. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I suspect that American Superconductor will probably keep getting a lot of contracts through Sinovel. Um, of course, there's like, you can play certain utilities that maybe are heavy on, uh, on renewables, there's some uh, companies like ITC Holdings, which is a company that builds transmission. They're uh, trying to build this transmission line in the Midwest. It's going to move a lot of wind power. Uh, it's called, I think it's called a green power line. It's a, it's a pretty big undertaking, but um, if it goes through, it's going to be very, very profitable. So Buffett's 10% stake in BYD, was that really an electric car play, or what was he doing there? Uh, yeah, I think he was trying to get on the, yeah, I mean, electric cars. I, they're going to launch a sedan, I think, in the U.S. in the next couple of years. 2011, I think, is when it arrives here. You know, was it for the battery power, or was it actually for the, the technology? That's a, that's a tough call. I don't know. The technology isn't any different than anything else. I mean, they haven't, again, they, they haven't reinvented the wheel. Um, electric cars are really easy to make. I have a friend that made one in his garage. Uh, you know, it's, um, they're the, they're, they are the first company that has mass-produced an electric car. Um, so uh, I, I, I think... I, and I don't know for sure. I, I can just guess. My, my gut tells me that he looked at China and said, okay, China's going to be a very big car manufacturing hub, um, and electric cars really are, plug-in hybrids and electric cars really are the future of, mm -hmm. of personal transportation. We may not see that now, but you know, the other day I was watching TV. I was watching the, you know, what, what happened the past decade. Where were we in 2000 and 2010? And I was thinking about my, you know, my cell phone in 2000. was huge. And it was it did, a briefcase. It, it wasn't that bad, <laughs> but it, it, it was pretty big, and it, it made phone calls. That's all it did. You know? and, and now I have a droid, and it's awesome, and I can do all kinds of great things. And on the, on the, uh, on the train up, I, you know, I was watching YouTube. You know, it's, yeah. I, in 2000, I never would have thought I would have had something had something like that and been able to get it so cheap. So um, He's making a bet on the future. Absolutely. And, and you it, think this is coming within the next 10 years? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's going to be... I mean, it's already kind of here, but it's kind on of a here. mass scale. You're not going to see, you know, it's not going to take over, you know, the internal combustion engine in the next 10 years. But I, I think that where, where regular hybrids are today is where plug-in hybrids will be and electric vehicles will be in 10 years. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Sure.